the sustainability management master's program you are answering one simple question do you care about your future generation you know if you care about your kids their kids their grandkids then you care about sustainability and a sustainability manager is someone who has the tools to make people understand how they can contribute towards developing a sustainable world we have both part time and full time students our curriculum is 30 hours instead of thesis we have a research project course and a seminar course which provides them with the kind of research background they will need to be successful in their job at the same time sustainability is not always everything about environment it also relates to the business they will take a sustainable business strategies course they will take a project management course most of these courses are going to be taught by industry people the people who are doing sustainability on a daily basis as a part of their job any organization that has a large number of employees and has a physical infrastructure they will have to have a sustainability office if you have the passion to develop and maintain a sustainable world come to us and we will help you shape your passion into a career which will create an impact thank you very much and uh thank you all first thank you for inviting me to come here and thank you all for coming on ash wednesday and valentine's day and taking the time out of your schedules to come here so first of all i know i mentioned this just briefly when you know the room was filling up but i have information here available on the brownfield coalition of the northeast or bcon's northeast sustainable communities workshop um it's a great opportunity to have um educational sessions that we have about sustainable different projects that are going on different initiatives um how you partner how you collaborate and then also we build in time for networking at this event as well so we would love to have volunteers to come help us with that i have contact information on here for um Marianne Marianne Leone she is going to be coordinating all the volunteers she did it last year and i know Stevens sent a ton of students Yeah. And it's free if you volunteer if you don't want to volunteer and you just want to attend. I think it's something like $25 for students in the early bird and $35 um under the standard fee for students. But if you volunteer, you can get in for free. And actually just so you know, that's kind of a tip I would give you is for a lot of these organizations, they may not be advertising that they have um free opportunities for students but if you call up and you talk to the person organizing the event and offer to volunteer um a lot of times they will give you a complimentary registration if you come and volunteer at those programs so keep that in mind i also put on here the lsrpa information um another great organization i'm also a member of that Again, students are free to join. Students are free to join Vcon, so there's no reason you shouldn't be members of those organizations, quite frankly. Um and again, the LSRPA has some webinars available on their website like how to find a job uh in the environmental field. So for all of you who are going to be looking for jobs and careers, it's it is an amazingly good webinar. Um it's only like 45 minutes long. So definitely take a look at that. uh they have scholarships available and you can post your resume on their resume portal for the LSRPA and then the uh firms who are members of the LSRPA can go in and look and find your resume and contact you so um some really great resources i hope that you guys use them um so i want to talk to you guys about how do we transform those eyesores to eye candy the brownfields redevelopment basics And what kind of brought me here to thinking about this is that throughout the state of New Jersey right now they're saying there's about 14,000 environmentally contaminated sites and most of those sites are brownfield sites or sites that are not being used to their full potential. In 2009, the legislature passed the Site Remediation and Reform Act, the New Jersey legislature. It's also called SARA. And as part of that act, the New Jersey DEP began that process of licensing private consultants 
to be LSRPs to conduct the environmental assessments, characterizations, investigations, and certify the environmental cleanups. This program has been amazing because it has really expedited the process. It used to take such a long period of time because you were going back and forth with the DEP proposing stuff and then the DEP saying, well, that's not acceptable. And um, now it's all up to the LSRP. They, it's their license on the line. So they need to um, make sure that they're doing stuff that protects human health and the environment. And they're able to move things much more quickly. So I'm going to talk to you about that program. I'm going to talk to you about what brownfields are, how they can be assets, and the whole process of brownfield redevelopment, as well as that role of environmental consultants and LSRPs. So first of all, the first thing is, what is a brownfield? And this is the EPA's definition. It's a little bit dry, but I will read it with you. It is the real property, the expansion, redevelopment, or reuse of which may be complicated by the presence or potential presence of a hazardous substance, pollutant, or contaminant. So what do they mean by that? Um, brownfield sites are really just sites that even can be just perceived to have contamination that's interfering with their redevelopment. Um, I like to say that they're just like any other real estate development project, just with an environmental twist. So the concept of brownfields is taking something that's bad or harmful and turning it into an asset for the community, something that's good for the people that are living there. You know? And this is where it really ties in with sustainability, because as these sites get revitalized and cleaned up, they're strengthening the community health, equity, sustainability, and resiliency. So there's a little bit of a history um, that I'm you know, going to go over with you very briefly about brownfields. I mean, you think about it like the Industrial Revolution and all these companies that were processing different chemicals and especially way back when didn't have any kind of really good what I call housekeeping. So there were spills, they were dumping their chemicals. Um, then in the, you had mills, you had factories, that's like kind of what I'm showing on the left. You could have gas stations that become abandoned, and you know they're also a problem. Um, and then all the way on the right, I'm showing something that kind of looks like a pretty field, but also had illegal dumping that occurred. So maybe brownfields aren't always obvious when you see them. Um, they can be found anywhere, because again, you know, just about everywhere has gas stations, right? And everywhere could have the potential for somebody to have done illegal dumping, even in rural areas. But the concentration of brownfields tends to be in those more urban areas where you had the big factories and then you had that urban exodus where people left and you're kind of left with this vacant property that nobody's using. So again, it's not just the industries of the 19th century. You know, it, it is things like gas stations and dry cleaners. So you know, we're still making them today. And I don't want to get political here, but you know, <laughs> if we're going to loosen all these environmental regulations, we could be creating more brownfields, right? So, you know, I'd like to focus on cleaning up the ones we have and not create new ones. But that's just, I won't get political. Um, so there are disadvantages, obviously. And I probably don't need to go over all of them with you because you can probably just intuit what they are. But, you know, they have the potential to harm human health and the environment. They can lower the surrounding property values. If you have like one of those ugly sites that you saw, and you don't want to really live next to it. Um, it contributes to that neighborhood deterioration, to the perception, uh, negative perceptions of a neighborhood. They can attract vandals, um, attract people to do open dumping or other illegal activities. Um, and they contribute to sprawl, because if you're not redeveloping your brownfield site, that means you're going somewhere else when you're developing a site. And maybe you're going to the suburbs, to a green field. Having a brownfield that's unused is nobody's being employed there, right? Or if it's, a, if it's underutilized, not as many people are being employed there as could be. It reduces the uh, tax revenue that a city can collect. And that's really important, because um, we work a lot with, that's what I work with a lot, is the municipal governments. They need that tax revenue to fund all the programs that they have, you know, from police and fire to trash pickups to schools, you know, you name it, all those services that municipalities provide, they need money to do that. So when you have sites like this that aren't producing anything, they um, reduce the tax revenue that they get. And of course, they limit growth. 
But that said, there are advantages to having a route field, and that's what I want you guys to focus on. So one of the first things I would say is the location efficiency. Um, when you think about why were these factories or you know, whatever the purpose of that site was originally, why was it put where it was? And there was probably a good reason. So a lot of the, the factories, the mills, were right along riverways, right? Um, most of these sites, at some point, whether they were designed initially or not, they had great infrastructure now. So you have um, rail, you have water and sewer, you have electric, um, you know, all these different things that if you're going to go out and build on a greenfield site, you'd have to put in, you know, brand new water mains and sewer mains. If you go to a brownfield site, it's very good likelihood that you already have that infrastructure in place. And I have a statistic up here um, about vehicle miles traveled. And this is really kind of ties into the sustainability aspect. EPA has found a 32 to 57 percent reduction in the vehicle miles traveled when a development occurs on a brownfield rather than on a greenfield. So view, fewer vehicle miles traveled makes a reduction in greenhouse gases. Now that's important for sustainability, but it also means to me, um, I'm looking a little bit further into that statistic, and I think one of the things it could be representing is that, you know, if you see sites like this, for me anyway, I might be rolling up my car windows and locking my doors and driving right past them. I am not stopping there. If you turn this into some really cool thing, maybe it's like a new brew pub or you know, whatever it turns out to be, now it's a place I'm going to, so I'm stopping there, so I'm not traveling beyond that. So you're bringing the amenities to people, and I, I think that that might be why you're seeing part of that um, vehicle miles travel reduction. So other advantages to having a brownfield site is just the idea that they're a potential. They're an opportunity to become a community asset. And you can see here a couple before and afters. You can see um, one site that was turned into, I think it's either an office building or um, like light industrial manufacturing. So now you have jobs there. Um, the bottom one you see is housing. So now people have a place to live. Um, on the right, you see a hotel that was built. So again, that's bringing in tax revenue to the municipality. There are um, other reasons to clean them up. Let's say environmental. Let's start with that, the environmental benefits of brownfield cleanup. So first of all, I mean, it's, it's kind of obvious, but you're removing the health and safety hazards. You're removing the risks for exposure when you're cleaning up these sites. You're improving the environmental quality. You're removing eyesores, and you're improving the community appearance. It also alleviates the community fears and worries. So if you're like concerned because you live next to this like decaying old mill, and you're like, what is going on there? And this is kind of scary. When you get into it and you start cleaning this all up, you know, now the community can start to feel good about what's going on there. Um, it promotes what we call infill development, which really just means the idea that you're developing um, where there's already development around, right? You're not going out to that green field somewhere else. Again, you know, it reduces your infrastructure costs, it reduces sprawl, and it does increase property values. So one thing I wanted to say, there was a study in an area of Delaware where it was described as like a high poverty, high crime area, and they looked at what the social and demographic changes were after they did a brownfield redevelopment, and they found positive changes in the economy, in civic pride, and community engagement. And I think that's like kind of a really nice story about brownfields, is that civic pride, that you know, people are now like proud to be from that location, right? I mean, I could tell you Hoboken, when I was a kid, Hoboken was like this place nobody wanted to come to. It was filled with all kinds of brownfields. But they had people come in and they cleaned it up and they turned all these things into assets. And now, like, anybody would be proud to be from Hoboken, right? Um, they found that it improved property maintenance. It decreased illegal dumping. It improved community services. They now have a faith-based organization that located on the site. They have a new health clinic, so people have access to health care. Um, it improved home ownership rates, so all kinds of really good things can come out of it. On the property values, I just have a statistic for you. EPA found that residential property values increased between 5 and 13 percent when a nearby brownfield was cleaned up. So 
Again, you know, that's helping the people that own property that live there. We can get into another discussion about equity and, you know, people, if you're cleaning up in places where people aren't really homeowners and they're more renters, um, it becomes a little bit of, it becomes an issue and it needs to be dealt with. And one of the ways people deal with it is they build affordable housing. Um, that helps. I don't think that's the entire answer. I mean, to me, the entire answer is get all of these cleaned up, turn all of these into smart growth opportunities so that it doesn't cost more to live in that nice place, make everything a nice place. And then um, I think that kind of gets the answer, but it's going to take us a long time to get there. Uh, one other statistic I had for you on this. So the infill development, reducing sprawl, right? They had a study that showed one acre of a brownfield that was redeveloped saved four and a half acres of a greenfield being developed. So I think that's really important, you know, when, again, when you're kind of thinking about how is this sustainable, you know, do you want to keep going into the greenfield or do you want to kind of redevelop that old land that's already um, had a use? So again, it increases the local tax base. So this is now on the economic side of things. They showed, there was a study showed that um, a public investment between, of $1 yields between $5 and $20 in the property value increase. So public investment in brownfields, generally, if, if the public dollars are being put towards it, which a lot of times they are, and you need sort of to get over that bump of what it costs to remediate the site. So municipalities, states, federal government, they have different programs that can help fund these to some degree. Um, but they found if they, they do that, that you will get back that money um, very quickly in like five years you will have recouped your investment and then anything else is gravy on top of that, right? For every um, ten to thirteen thousand dollars spent on brownfield remediation, a new job is created. So they're also creating jobs. So I hope at this point you guys understand sort of why it's important to redevelop brownfields and how important it is. So now I just want to take you guys on a tour of some different types of brownfield redevelopments that are out there. So this first one, um, you, you know, really the answer is you can redevelop a brownfield for anything you want. Um, the sky is the limit as long as you clean it up appropriately, right? But sometimes when I work with the communities, I kind of have to show them different examples so that they can be like, wow, we could really do that in our community too. So here you have like parks and open space. This one is right at the foot of the Taconi Palmyra Bridge. That's actually, we're on the Philadelphia side here. Um, that site had actually been a ferry terminal and had sat vacant since the Taconi Palmyra Bridge opened in like 1928. And then over time, it became um, invasive species. There was trash there. And at some point um, in the 2000s, there was an oil spill that happened from a tanker. And so eventually they said, you know, we got to do something, we got to clean this up. And they turned it into this great park. And that park um, is now like a vital connector to the neighborhood on the other side of I-95. And there's also a bike trail that's kind of part of this as well. And that's going to stretch not just from like one end of Philadelphia to the other, but it's the East Coast Greenway. And that's going to go from Key West to Canada. So it's really important to think about that and like integrate things when you're doing planning aspects. Think about how you can integrate things and bring those new connections. Another park, has anybody in here been to the High Line? Raise your hand. It's about half of you. It's a great park, right? So there's a before picture. You can see it's definitely a brownfield, underutilized, um, an eyesore, right? And it's turned into this great park that's a great community asset. You can turn it into commercial. So I have up here the Bronx Terminal Market. So these are people that really didn't have easy access to do the shopping they needed to do. And now they have this whole complex where they can go. I love this bottom one, the FedEx facility. This is a sorting facility. This used to be um, the Albert Steel Drum, I guess either manufacturer or uh, recycler that was there. And it was definitely a brownfield. This is near the airport. So it makes a lot of sense, you think sustainably, Let's, the FedEx planes are flying in, let's have that sorting facility really close to the airport. Um, and, and so that's what they did, and it brought jobs to that community. Redevelopment, again, residential is an option. These are market rate units in Bayonne, but again, you can definitely bring affordable housing into it as well. Um, 
Harrison Commons, this is now mixed use, so you have your commercial, your retail shops on the ground floor and then the residential above it. This is really common. Um, you can do green energy. You're seeing um, a solar farm. I believe that's on a landfill, actually. The school. So I like to point this one out, too, because people kind of freak out when you talk about brownfields, environmental contamination, and schools in the same sentence. And the answer is you have to do an appropriate cleanup. But if you do the appropriate cleanup, yes, you can absolutely put a school on there. So we're not advocating putting students on a dirty site. You know, that's definitely not what I'm saying. But I'm saying clean up these sites, and then you can reuse them. And you can see there's also one at the bottom as a courthouse. They, same thing, can be urban agriculture. So you see here um, a commercial farm and a community garden. So let's say that, yes, you have a brownfield. What is that process? How do you get through it? Who's typically involved? There's a lot of people. This is a team sport when you're dealing with brownfields. And I think that's one thing I'd really like to make sure you guys understand is that in this field, and I think in a lot of fields, you know, whatever field you do choose to go into, you're going to find that you have to work as part of a team. And you have to figure out how to align everybody's priorities. Um, how to work together. So in a brownfield, you might have a property owner. The community has a stake in this, the people who live there, of course. They're the ones who, it's their, in a way, it's their project because they're the ones who are going to be living next to it for the rest of their lives. The local government entity, developer, the environmental regulator. In New Jersey, the environmental consultant, which is going to be an LSRP. And the funder, the bank, the lender, whoever has that money. These, and there could be more people, but this is just sort of a an idea of typical ones that are involved. All right, so in New Jersey, we have a history, of course, of industrial past with the bays, the rivers between New York and Philadelphia left a legacy of pollution. So in 1976, New Jersey passed the first program in the nation. It was called the Spill Act, and it really was about the cleanup of contaminated sites that posed a risk to human health in the environment became a national model for other programs, including for the National Superfund program. What happened, though, was by like the mid-2000s, New Jersey had more than 20,000 projects in its site remediation program, with more constantly being added to it. And the demand on that system just meant that there were like these really long delays. And sites just sat there with nothing happening on them. But there were exposures happening. So it was really a bad situation. The NJDEP commissioner, who you can see in the bottom right at the time, um, was Lisa Jackson, who went on to serve in President Obama's cabinet um, as administrator of the EPA. At the time, she was the commissioner of the DEP. She testified before the state legislature and told them, you know, the system is broken. And she advocated for the passage of that Site Remediation Reform Act, or SARA. And under that, it put an affirmative, affirmative obligation on the responsible parties to clean up their sites. That means if you have pollution on your site and you're responsible for it, you can't just sit there. You have to actually do stuff. They set up mandatory time frames in there that said you have to do it by this time. But it also set up the LSRP program. And it put the onus um, of a lot of the stuff on the shoulders of the LSRP to make those decisions about how do you clean up the site? How do you investigate the site? How many samples do you need? You know, those kinds of things. And what's really exciting about what we've done here is that with the same amount of staff at New Jersey DEP, they've been able to oversee twice the number of cleanups. So things are moving so much more quickly now that they have that program in place. It was based on models of programs in Massachusetts and Connecticut. And I guess the best way to describe the role of an LSRP might be they're guiding the project. They're guiding their clients. They're giving them advice. Um, they're also keeping the projects on track. So you know they're tracking when these different time frames are and you know making a roadmap on how do I get to have my remedial action work plan done by the date I need to have it done. So now, under this new program, a remediating party doesn't have to wait for DEP for them to say, OK, we approve your plan, and now you can go out and do it. And that has really helped, um, like I said, move things so much faster. 
It's also, according to the DEP, has actually, because it's now, you know, a person's license on the line, and as they put it, it's their retirement is on the line, their, their kid's inheritance is on the line, is how they put it. Um, people are a little bit, you know, nervous. They don't, they're not going to just willy-nilly approve things. And they said what has happened is that it's actually increased the quality of the reports and submittals that are coming into DEP since they passed this program. So this is sort of um, a typical laundry list of the phases of redeveloping a brownfield site. Um, everything is site specific, so it's going to be tailored to the specific site that you might be working on. And sometimes you'll get involved in different stages of the project. But kind of the way I break it down is the first step is visioning. It's, you know, what is, what is the site, getting the community involved, doing those planning aspects of it, figuring out what are you going to reuse the site as? That is so important to understand what the site reuse is because that affects what cleanup standards you use. There are different cleanup standards for residential versus industrial. Um, if you're going to use it as a park, maybe your cleanup isn't going to be to put an asphalt parking lot um, cap on top of it. You know, it's going to affect the type of remediation you do and also the time frames. The next part I kind of call the transactional piece, which is, you know, say you are a municipality and you want to get involved in a site like this. You can't just go on somebody's private property just because it's, you know, this big hulking eyesore in your community. You need to somehow acquire it and get site control of that. Um, and then you can do your environmental investigation. The next piece is really implementing that redevelopment, so you're doing your remediation. Um, there might be site preparation activities involved in that, like maybe there's demolition involved or bringing in some infrastructure. Yes? You mentioned a while back the FedEx project. Yes. FedEx yeah. I I don't know the history on that one, but I would guess that actually what happened was probably the city was involved, and the city probably... A lot of times what I see is the city will take ownership of the property and then the city will find somebody like FedEx that wants to locate at that site. So it could be done, it usually is done before the, like the tenant, the final tenant comes in. Like a developer might come in and do it and make money off the whole project. That's usually what I see. But the cities can also apply for the right? So there are grants, um, especially with EPA. The federal, at the federal level, there's a lot of grants um, available. And so cities, municipalities, public sector is typically who can get those grants. In the U.S., we typically don't give grants out to private companies. So a lot of times what will happen is, say you do have a privately owned piece of property, this is all legitimate, and this happens all the time, they will flip that to the city with like a redeveloper agreement, and then once you know, they do what they need to do under the grant funds, then it can get flipped back into the private sector. So these are some of the phases. I'm going to get a little more into what each of these phases are. But um, the first phase of an environmental investigation is actually called a phase one environmental assessment. And that is really just looking at the history what was used on the site, what chemicals were at the site, and you say, what environmental issues could I have based on what I know about the site without taking any samples? The next phase is the site investigation or phase two, and that's where you actually go out and take samples and say, okay, you know, do I actually have contamination or environmental issues, yes or no? And if you do, then the next phase would be a remedial investigation, trying to figure out how much do I have, where is it, um, how, how wide is it? How deep is it? Is it in groundwater? Is it in soil? Um, those kinds of things. And so now I'm going to take you sort of through each one in a little bit more detail. So that first one, again, is a phase one site assessment. And in New Jersey, we like to do things differently because that's how we do. I think kind of because of how we set up, we were like the first program in the nation is probably why that's the case. Uh, so we kind of set the standard and then it got tweaked along the way. But in New Jersey, we do something called a preliminary assessment. It's very similar to a phase one. There are some differences, some subtle differences. Um, it can be performed for different reasons, whether that's you know regulatory, like you have to do an investigation because you had a spill at your site, or maybe you're selling the site and the seller 
is interested in knowing what they're getting into, right? So a lot of time, or the buyer, I mean, the buyers a lot of times will do a phase one site assessment before purchasing a property. Again, it's non-intrusive, you no know sampling, you're just looking at the history, you're doing document research, you're doing interviews, um, no samples are collected at that phase. And this is some of the type of historical research that you might do. Um, you might look at some maps that are out there. You'll do database searches. So you'll look at the federal databases. You'll look at the state environmental records. Does this site have you know, permits? Do they have spills reported? Things like that. You might look at a topographic map, or you should, not you might. Um, and that gives you some information about the site. So in this particular one, you know, you can see it's right up against a river, the Cooper River. We know that groundwater typically flows um, towards the river when it's that close. So it gives you some idea of, you know, which way groundwater might be flowing. This is my favorite tool. Um, it's called the Sanborn Maps. These were actually developed by the fire insurance industry as a way to assess fire risk but they include all kinds of really awesome details, like um, the size and shape and construction of commercial buildings, the types of, like in this case, you can see like the different tanks that are there, what the historical use of the property was, what the historical use of the nearby properties were. Um, it, they come in different years, it varies, it's just like whenever the coverage was done, but you can order the whole package and you, know, you can look at it over the years and see, you know, where the buildings that came down, new buildings that were put up. So on this one, you can see the former gas holders at a manufactured gas plant. They also, in this one, it shows like an old stream in the upper right, the Shipley Stream, that actually was channeled underground. But it's still really important to know this because it actually has a big bearing on how groundwater contamination flows at this particular site. You can look at historic aerial photos. Again, this is like a snapshot in time. You can, again, identify the actual structures that were at a site. You can see what was developed or undeveloped. Um, you can see when new roads were put in, new buildings. Um, colleges, I don't know if Stevens probably has a library. They may have a library of historic aerial photos. I know some colleges do. The state library definitely does. Um, the web, New Jersey has a website with historical aerial photos on it as well. So I'm trying to think, on this one, yeah, you can really see how, I won't go too far. <laughs> the site changed. This is what the site ended up looking like when I worked on it. But this is what it looked like in, in some time previous. So you can really see how the shoreline had changed in there. And same thing, this is the same site, by the way, in Camden. This is a historic topo, so this is 1995. Um, this is kind of what the site looked like when I was working on it. This is what it looked like in 1949. It shows like a wetland on there. So what that tells me is that the site was probably filled in with what we call a New Jersey historic fill, which is often contaminated. So that's something I know I want to investigate. Um, we have these type of directories that are out there that you can, the city directory, this one's from 1973, it shows what businesses were present at a given address at a specific time. So you, you search by address and you can see what was there. Um, obviously, you know, if it turns out your site used to be a gas station or something like that, that's an important thing to know. We also, in the phase one, we go out to the site, we do site reconnaissance or um, a site visit. We walk the entire property and you're looking for you know, evidence of any kind of contamination or potential contamination that could happen at the site. Um, is there any evidence of spills, any evidence of buried materials? Um, do we smell anything odd? In New Jersey, we look at um, just the site, but in, if you're doing a phase one, which is under the federal, you also look at the surrounding area as well. You need to enter all the buildings you need to take photographs. You need to interview people. It's best to interview the people that know the most. The guy, usually it's like the janitor who worked there, is who actually is the guy you really want to talk to, who knows where stuff was disposed of. A lot of times you only get to talk to like a high level person who doesn't give you really all that good information. But talk to who you can, find out what you can when you go on the sites. And take really careful documentation. 
Try not to schedule it right after it's snowed, because then you can't really see the ground surface, right? Um, things we look for, USTs. So underground storage tanks. This is, um, this is actually that same site that I was showing you before. Th this was um, a Sears tire and battery, which meant that they changed oil, and I think they also, um, they probably had gasoline based on the fact that they had all these USTs there. But you look for things like the vent pipes, you see the fill ports that are there. And this is an above ground storage tank. You see some drums. Just showing you some examples of things that are out of these sites. Transformers, electrical transformers. Um, they may contain PCBs or may have contained PCBs in the past. So something to be concerned about. A chemical storage area. More drums. You know, do we notice a sheen on groundwater if it's out there? Floor drains. So, you know, any chemicals or spills would have gone into these floor drains. Where do these floor drains go? Are they going into the storm sewer? Um, are they, do they have leaks in the floor drains? It's going directly into the ground. You know, those are kinds of things you want to learn. Um, this is a site I worked at. This is the compressor that, that discharged above this. This is what the ground looked like below it. I'd be concerned of what happened there, right? So a phase two, so once we know the answer, like, is it possible that based on the historic uses at the site and the chemicals that may have been used at the site that I might have an issue, right? And on almost any site, I could make the case that the answer is probably yes. Um, the next phase is a phase two. And that's where we actually do the site investigation. In New Jersey, it's called a site investigation. And in New Jersey, we, we evaluate areas of concern. At the federal level, they're called RECs, Recognized Environmental Conditions. But we're New Jersey, so. <laughs> there are different ways to do this. You can do remote sensing. I'm going to show you some examples of that. You, the big thing you do is you collect samples. Soil, groundwater, air. You analyze those samples for whatever constituents of concern. So like we had petroleum tanks, so I would be testing for petroleum compounds, right? Uh, if it was a place that did some kind of like electroplating, I'd be testing for metals. You know, so that's what we would do. And then you compare those results to the regulatory standards. So this is an example of one type of remote sensing, just a magnetometer survey. So no property damage when you're doing this. You just are getting information on the subsurface conditions without digging, without drilling. But it only tells a partial story. Um, in this case, it's a magnetometer. Um, you can detect subsurface metal objects, like buried tanks or pipes. Ground penetrating radar. Um, this is something that we do just about any site, especially when I'm going to drill a well or do anything underground, because I want to know before I get out there if there is something like a electric line. <laughs> or any other kind of line, anything I don't want to hit when, with the drill rig as we're going underground. Um, so what this does is this puts an electromagnetic radiation into the subsurface and then detects the signals, the echoes that come off. So um, you can see things like tanks, pipes, septic systems, old foundations. This is an example of a tank, two tanks. You can see this is what it would look like on a good one. Sometimes they're a little... Hard to read. Um, you do your subsurface investigation. So this can be anything from a test pit, which I'll show you, to drilling, soil and groundwater, vapor intrusion testing. So here you have a test pit. And this is really just a fancy term for taking a backhoe and digging a pit. Like, dig, just dig something out. And then you're, like, looking in the pit that you just dug to see what's there. Typically, it's not going to look like this. This is probably like the, one of the worst case examples I could get for you. Um, but it reveals what's buried below the ground. In this case, they had like water heaters, plumbing fixtures, all kinds of things in there. And they later found out that the property owners had told the tenants that they needed to clean up the debris that they had on the property. And so it turns out that the tenants must have buried all the debris. <laughs> um, here's another test pit. And you can see in this one um, some white like paste at the bottom there. And that actually is um, from arsenic. And I believe there was a tannery is what caused that. We talk about soil borings and wells. This is um, a typical unit that we might use, a drill rig that we might use to conduct soil borings or install a well. 
when we do a soil boring, um, especially with a rig like that, you'll get these soil cores that come back. Uh, so the soil is collected as the drill bit is lowered down in, and then this, the whole core is pulled back up, and you get something like this. Here we're showing some thin layers of coal tar. When we get this back, you know, we're going to log all of the soil conditions, all the lithology that we see, and then we're going to note things like the coal tar that we see in there. We use field monitoring equipment um, when we do this. So on the left, you see what we call a PID, a photo ionization detector. This can detect volatile organics. We would actually use this and like run that along the soil core to see um, if we're getting any hits um, to show us like, hey, maybe I need to collect a sample at that location. And on the right, that's a piece of groundwater monitoring equipment, detects things like pH, redox potential, um, conductivity. This is a very much more sophisticated type of tool, downhole logging. Um, I think it's a great tool. It can only be used in certain lithologies, and North Jersey is not really a great place to use it because we have um, so many like cobbles and boulders um, from the glacial till that's there. But a um, place like South Jersey is really good for it. Um, it's to, on the right, what you can see is it detects, um, you have little peaks here where it's showing um, volatile organic um, concentrations at 11.3 ppm. And then you also get things like conductivity that tell you about the lithology as well. So I mentioned monitoring wells. This is what a monitoring well looks like in the field. Um, actually would have like a manhole cover right on top. It's what you would typically see. This PVC is the actual well. This is like a two inch well. And this is um, a water level indicator. So they just drop this tool down there. It's got a little sensor on the bottom. When it comes in contact with the water, it sends like electrical signal back, beeps at you, little light lights up, and then you measure on that measuring tape just how deep you are. We use the monitoring wells also as a portal to collect groundwater samples. And then once we collect our samples, um, typically, we send them to a sophisticated lab like this um, who analyzes them. They have really high-tech equipment, things like the gas chromatographs, um, inductively coupled plasma um, that can get really low detection limits for us, like things like PPM and PPB, parts per million, parts per billion. I just included this slide in here. Um, I, are the students going to have access to the... So if you want to learn more about environmental investigations, this is a really good video. It's short, I don't know, five minutes. Um, the New York City Office of Environmental Remediation put this video together um, that shows um, how these investigations are done. So it has like, you know, really in the field kind of thing. So once we know we have contamination, like I said, we do that remedial investigation. Um, we're going to assess the extent and severity of the contamination. So again, how deep is it? How wide is it? What specific chemicals? Um, is it in the groundwater? Is it in the soil? That kind of thing. Once we know that, um, we know the nature and the extent, we can actually figure out how we're going to clean it up, right? And that's when we put together our remedial action work plan. We put together our remedial design. Um, then we have to actually implement the plan, so we can't just stop there. But what I would say with the plan is that's a good place developers like to get involved in sites because now they know how much it's going to cost them. They have a really good, more certainty around, like, how long is it going to take and how much is it going to cost me? I'll go past that. So different ways to remediate, and I'll show you each of these. Tank removal, so you had an underground storage tank. This is what it looks like when you pull it out. This is what it looks like when it has holes that indicates it may have leaked. Um, you can do things like remediate through source removal in this particular one. Um, we're showing, uh, like this is in the groundwater, they're gonna pump this out, it's gonna be treated, the clean water after it's treated will go back in. This is in situ re remediation, so in this one we could inject something into the wells um, that would help promote the either oxidation or reduction of whatever chemical is in there using different kind of microbes and things. And then on the right, this is actually just air sparging, so we're putting air into the ground. So the oxygen is helping to feed those microbes in the ground to help accelerate the cleanup. 
in situ stabilization. I have actually never worked on a site that used this, um, but I know that there are sites that do this. And so basically, you're all, it's almost like you're mixing concrete with the soil and you're making it like really solid and you're making it so that the contaminants can't leach out. Uh, groundwater treatment, this is just a picture of what it would look like, um, a typical system. And you have up here, and this one is a catox unit, a catalytic oxidizer. Once you've done your remediation, um, you are going to collect samples to show that it actually is clean, um, to document it, to prove it, and then you're going to write a report. And in New Jersey, um, the measure of finality is that you have that remedial action outcome letter that's written by the LSRP. That's not the only thing that goes on with brownfields. There are other things um, because we're reusing these sites. So this is kind of a list of other things. You might need permits and approvals. You might need demolition. A lot of this can go on at the same time that you're doing your environmental investigations. Construction. Um, I have integrated remediation cap, and a lot of brownfields, at least one of the technologies used is that we cap the site. So that could be part of a parking lot, it could be part of a building foundation that you're putting in. Um, if you're working with a private developer, you're going to have ownership and leasing transactions finalized. And then finally, that property is being reused. We always get the question, how long, how much will it cost? It depends. Depends on what your reuse option is, depends on what type of contamination you have, what cleanup standards you're going for. Oh, and availability of funding. We talked, I think, a lot about this already. What is environmental consulting um, and LSRPs? So LSRPs remediate hazardous sites in New Jersey. They self-certify those completed remediations. But above all, their most important thing is to protect human health and the environment. This is who would hire an LSRP, basically anybody that has a site that, in New Jersey that they need to be cleaned up. Um, so it ranges from industrial companies to maybe a municipality. The job of an LSRP, one of the things I really want to stress with you is that it is working with people. Again, this is all like a team sport. And this isn't just for an LSRP. This could be for any kind of environmental consultant. Um, you're working with architects. You're working with planners. Um, you're working with engineers and other scientists, attorneys. You're working with construction contractors, developers. You're working with contract laboratories, vendors. Um, regulatory authorities like DEP or EPA, you're working with the residents who might be concerned about the site, and just other stakeholders in the area as well. So you really need to have very good um, communication skills. And I'm going to get to that on the next slide. I don't want to take too much longer because I want to get to the, um, to the questions, to more questions. But LSRPs, this is what they do. And this isn't just LSRPs. This is any environmental consultant and probably I dare say just about anything you're going to do with an environmental engineering degree. So I will take a minute on this slide. Um, I was shocked when I started my career and found out I had to do all these things that I was not prepared to do at all. So to the extent that you can learn these skills here, um, get involved with programs here like the, you said there's an MBA program that will teach you some of these skills. I would say one thing that in consulting um, that puts you way ahead, not just environmental consulting, but any kind of consulting, so engineers, uh, you know, PEs, is the ability to attract and retain clients. So sales, basically, is really sets you apart if you can do that. But this, in addition to all that, you have to prepare and manage budgets. You put together proposals, and then if it turns out that you went over budget because of some reason that was outside of your control. You got to get the client to agree, put a change order to the client, get them to pay up. You manage project schedules. Again, you're interacting with all these different stakeholders. You're overseeing written and verbal communications. Um, and you're also ensuring that everything you're doing is complying with the different regulations and laws that are out there. So you communicate in writing. You're going to develop work plans. You're going to put together contracts with vendors. You're coordinating with other project team members. You're preparing and reviewing reports, letters, and memos. So 
you know, realize how important writing is in what you will be doing. So if you wanted to do um, environmental consulting or an LSRP type career, I just put together a quick slide on what, you know, it would look like. Your first, say, five years, you might be the person out in the field collecting the samples, overseeing the drillers, um, managing the data when it comes back in, maybe doing QA, QC on it, and just being the eyes and ears of the project team. As you get to the mid-level, you're going to be managing projects. You're going to be designing those remedial actions at that point. You're going to be writing reports, meeting with clients, managing the project budgets. As you get to the more senior level, now you're managing a project team. So you're managing people, right? Um, you're obtaining clients. Again, that's retaining, getting clients, managing client relationships, so important. You're going to be responsible for fiscal matters, employee performance. And you may participate in either the vision or company management. This is what it takes to become an environmental consultant. So you need a degree in that field. Master's degree will really help your career. Um, and PhD is useful if you want to get into a real technical specialty. Again, you need those effective communication skills, basic computer knowledge. Um, experience isn't required, but it is a plus. So if you can get an internship, it will really, really help you. And then the other piece on there I have listed is the 40-hour HAZWOPER course. Have you guys heard of what that is? Most of you have heard of that? Okay. So if you can get that, that will give you a leg up on the people who don't have that when they apply for jobs. The LSRPA, I gave you guys the information. There's over 800 LSRPs who practice in New Jersey. That was the number I got the latest. Um, again, for the LSRPA, it's not just LSRPs and aspiring LSRPs, but all the folks that want to work with them. And we do have the free student level membership. You can learn about environmental consulting, make business contacts. We have the scholarship, the resume portal, and I have the website, lsrpa.org. BCON, the Northeast Sustainable Communities Workshop, we already talked about that. BCON membership is free for academia. The website, brownfieldcoalitionne.org. That's it. Okay. Thank <laughs> you.